Super. So it was declared by the General Assembly of the United Nations back in 2013. And uh, so I want to extend a particular welcome to the students of PS40. Who is PS40? Yay! <laughs> as well as the students of the Salk School of Science. <laughs> well, I'm so happy because, you know, the UN is our common home. And the SDGs are our tools uh, to make the world a better place. So do you know what the SDGs are about? So, uh, the SDGs uh, were adopted by in 2015. They are called the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, we, I, we adopt the 17 goals for four of them, 12, 13, 14, 15, uh, are, more, and, uh, are more related to what we are celebrating today. Uh, but I invite you, because it's the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, so the website of the UN is amazing. The hashtag UN75, and uh, to, to make, uh, uh, take action, uh, you should go with your school on un.org and check the website and you will learn a lot. So anyway, uh, so I hope that uh, none of you has brought plastic inside the United Nations. Uh, they are banned since last year in the UN headquarters. New York State, you probably know because you are New York kids, have also banned single-use plastic as of two days ago. Uh, well, in Monaco, we did it a few years ago. So you, you may wonder why I raised the particular issue of plastic. Well, unfortunately, plastic is a major pollutant, and uh, we end up ingesting uh, plastic just uh, eating fish. So we have and we must to curb that addiction to plastic that the entire world has. So today, uh, today is going to be amazing. Uh, thanks for this gentleman. Today we want to showcase how by working all together here at the United Nations, we can make a positive difference for the planet and its inhabitants, you, me, everybody, and in particular its fauna and flora. So government have developed a set of uh, uh, instruments, you know, we call them uh, legal instruments, to, to do so and to protect the earth biodiversity. So I don't want to bore you uh, uh, because you, I know you're waiting uh, for, for Roy to present his beautiful animals, but I just want to name two. One is called CITES, and since uh, 1975 it is a treaty uh, that regulates the international trade of endangered species uh, with fauna and flora. So the second one is the Convention on, on Bio Biological Diversity uh, that is best known under the acronym CBD. So both are core elements of Monaco policy to, towards the protection of the environment and world biodiversity. From the native Mediterranean seagrass, which we call Posidonia, uh, to the European eel from a plant species uh, of the, to the peregrine falcon, which is a beautiful bird. Uh, the princely government and the Prince Albert II Foundation uh, work hand in hand and spare no effort to combat pollution and all its form and to protect endangered species. So the permanent mission of Monaco and my colleagues that I, I thank very much uh, are very thrilled that we could um, uh, share today with a multiple award uh, winner, Roy Galitz, to celebrate this year's team sustaining all life on Earth. So uh, you will soon learn, or if you will better understand, how all species are intricately linked. Uh, we are very grateful that uh, he accepted to share with us the beautiful and amazing images captured during his many expeditions, and I'm very jealous of his job, uh, as he's a great advocate and an effective ambassador to the, those endangered animals. So we couldn't pick a, a, a better teacher today for explaining why it is so important to protect what we call the wildlife and why the extinction of one species is not only a great loss for the whole humanity, but all, can also trigger catastrophic consequences. So Roald Galit's passion for, has brought him from the Arctic Ocean to the most unhospitable Antarctica continent. So we have to remind ourselves 
that by celebrating the planet, as we are going to do today, the planet's biodiversity, we ultimately celebrate our own life on Earth. So it is our duty, it is your duty, it is my duty, everybody's duty, to work to protect the planet for future generations, but I do believe that it's also a very uh, survival human instinct in doing so. So dear guest, I'm gonna join you and enjoy uh, Explorer Roy Gadlitz's presentation. Thank you. so much, Her Excellency Ambassador Isabel Pico of Monaco. Thank you all for coming here today. Uh, I'm Roy Galitz, uh, a wildlife photographer, and as a wildlife photographer, I go all over the world photographing endangered animals. So I travel from the North Pole to the South, from the eastern part of Kamchatka, all the way through Africa, and to the western part of North America. And all of these journeys have taught me that our world is changing in an increasing rate. Everything is changing so quickly that I had to do something about it. And I was honored to become an ambassador for Greenpeace and share this passion onwards and partner up with the Monaco mission uh, and with uh, the Prince Albert II, who's doing a lot of good work for the environment, and I'm honored to be here with you. We don't have a lot of time, and we have a lot of world to go through. So without further ado, I'm going to take you to one of my favorite places on Earth, Svalbard. Svalbard is a Norwegian archipelago right near the North Pole. And the reason why I go there is polar bears. Now, conditions in Svalbard are different from the conditions, conditions here in New York, okay? This is how I look like when I work, so it's a different kind of suit. And although it's cold, I learned that there is no such thing as cold There is not properly dressed. So when I'm there, this is how I look. Okay, it's a, it's always, I'm always laughing that I'm smiling in this photo because it's a selfie, so you have to smile. On another occasion, I encountered a blizzard. And that's the way I looked like in the blizzard. But again, I'm not cold, thanks to the fact that I'm dressed really well. I go there with my snowmobile, and I go through mountains and valleys and glaciers and sea ice. In 2015, I flew my drone there for the first time. And when I got the drone up in the air, everything looked even more amazing. It looks like something out of Game of Thrones, if you know what I mean. Can we reduce the light, by the way, technical team? Can we reduce the lights? If we can, it will be cool. Yeah, thank you. You can hear me. Okay. Um, I went into an ice cave. So that's me in the entrance to an ice cave. And what I like about this ice cave, that it looks actually like a shark's mouth. And everything around looks amazing, like it's out of Narnia. And where do I sleep? I slept in an abandoned Russian town of Pyramiden. It was bought by Stalin, and it's very Soviet. There are six people who live there. And I don't think they know that the Soviet Union has collapsed because they're still celebrating. But I didn't have the heart to tell them that the Soviet Union is no longer existing. So, but we're not there to eat borscht. We are there looking for polar bears. And polar bears are not so easy to find because the polar bears are what color? White. And the surrounding is white. So it's really difficult to find them. So we went into an ice cave following a polar bear's tracks, but he wasn't there, which is also a good thing, because <laughs> if he was, uh, we had to run. And then, finally, we spotted our first polar bear. So we got the gear ready, set the cameras, and what I saw is this mother polar bear and her young cub, but they are running away. They don't want to be photographed. They're scared. 
So, of course, we don't chase them, and we simply go looking for another kind of bear, the indifferent one. And that's when I found this beautiful bear. And this is a polar bear mother and her two adorable little cubs, and they are walking towards me. Okay, you can imagine my excitement. And then mother bear finds a seal's breathing hole. And she waits near the breathing hole for a seal to come up and breathe. And then hopefully she can feed her young cubs. And then they went to sleep. <laughs> When they woke up, you could see how much the polar bear mother loves her cub. And how much her cub loves its mother. And I guess the cub did something he was embarrassed of. And then the cub started walking towards me. One is sticking his tongue out. And then his sister shook her snow off her. And the brother didn't like it. Suddenly, Mother Bear leaned back and did this kind of motion. The two little bear, bears started running really fast, like racing towards her. And she started breastfeeding them. So polar bear mother is breastfeeding her twins. And she's breastfeeding them with 30% fat milk. So that's like molten ice cream. But they have to grow up fast. After they drink milk, like all babies, they fall asleep again. And then they wake up. And when the cubs wake up, they like to run around. And that's the way the days continue to go. Mother bear feeds. They go to sleep, she feeds, they go to sleep, and onwards. But she has to eat, because she hasn't eaten in the last four and a half months. She didn't have anything to eat. Because when, uh, when her cubs are being born, they are born in the wintertime, in December, in the den. And the cubs are born like the size of a squirrel, blind and bald, with no hair. And Mother Bear breastfeeds them, and she can't move, and she doesn't get out of the den. So she doesn't eat for four or five months. And this is food. So that's a ringed seal, and the polar bear mother is behind him. Uh, but he's careless. He doesn't mind. He's relaxing, sunbathing. Mother Bear is trying to hunt him, but the cubs are making too much noise. And every time they jump on the ice, the seals hear it, and they go to the next breathing hole, hoping not to become dinner. And Mother Bear tries again, but the cubs are still making too much noise. You see, they keep playing while Mother is trying to hunt. So Mother Bear is furious. But you can't be too mad with these adorable little things. Especially when they just roll around in the snow. So Mother Bear still needs to hunt. And she's waiting and waiting and waiting for the seal to come up and breathe and then she can catch him. So at this point, I'm telling Tom, my local polar bear specialist, listen, Tom, I want to photograph polar bear mother hunting a seal. So Tom tells me, well, it's a good thing you want that, but the chances are 0%. So I'm asking him, why are you being so negative? So he tells me the only reason is that everybody wants to photograph that, but he, it has never been done before. So I'm thinking to myself, one more reason to do it, and let's understand why did it fail. And then we started learning about all the things that can go wrong while trying to photograph something like that. So we had to stay back. We went 200 feet away from the polar bears, and we had to be on our knees. And we can't move because every slight motion compresses the snow and transmits the sound through the ice and then the, polar, the seal will hear it. And then not only will I not get my shot, but more importantly, the polar bear mother won't eat. So we are like that. And the only thing we are allowed to do for hours and hours is, is only stretch and go back. And we can't move and we can't talk. And I have too much time to think about what the hell am I doing here. And how much I miss warm water and my kids. <laughs> and then suddenly, without any warning, 
We are up all through the night. Okay, the sun doesn't set. At 6.49 a.m., I heard a splash of water. I started clicking without even, even realizing what's happening. I see that the polar bear mother has caught something. And she's pulling it out of the ice. And then I noticed, oh my God, it's a seal. You could imagine my excitement. I wasn't cold anymore. <laughs> I wasn't bored. I was really ecstatic. And this image is the first ever of a polar bear catching a seal. So this is, <laughs> thank you. This is, this is really exciting. Of course, I didn't believe it has never been done. So the first thing I got, I did when I got to the internet is Google. <laughs> And I, of course, I didn't find anything, but it's also it's a privilege. And what I like about this photo, that it's not only a kill, it's also a lesson. Polar bear mother is teaching her cub how to hunt. And you can see the cub is learning. That's the female. The, the male is, he do, doesn't care. <laughs> but the female is a good student. She's learning because one day she'll have her own cubs to feed. And of course, breakfast. And the cub is very proud of its mother, and so he's sticking his tongue out. And the female says thanks to her mother. The cub is still, the male is still eating. And then there's dessert. And after food, they go to the playground. They have a different playground than you do. They're playing on the ice. Another year when I went there, I saw this male walking around the fjord. He's looking for a female, and that's our female. So he's getting closer, and he's searching for her. And when he's walking around the fjord, he's tasting the air, looking for pheromones, that special kind of hormones that tell him that the female is ready to mate. So he's searching for the female, and when he finds her, she is sleeping. So he's like, he's like a puppy. He's like, come on, wake up. And finally, when she wakes up and she's ready, they mate. And after they hug, the male has to cool things down. So he's doing yoga. And males being males, they do like stupid things. <laughs> and he walks around the fjord and walks around the fjord. And then they go their separate ways. Another male I saw, I saw a male this year, in 2019, my recent time there. I go there every year, three times a year. So I saw there in my recent trip there, a male fighting another big male. They were fighting, looked like, to the death. I was too far away and I didn't want to approach so I won't disturb them. But I got the view of the male after the fight. So he was injured, he was bleeding, he has a broken canine. And he's also searching for a female, because that's why males are fighting. We didn't know where the female was, so we just followed the male. He knew where she was. And then, of course, courtship again. This is romance. And some more cuddling. So that's what it looks like. And this is how polar bears are making new polar bears. And we need more polar bears around. So you see the male is looking for the female. This is the female walking around the fjord. And this is the courtship. So the male sings to her. You can see that he's singing. And then you can see the male and the female together. The female is on the right, the male is on the left. And now I'm going to show you her cub. So the male chased away her cub because as long as the cub is with its mother, she won't mate with him. So we chase the cub away. And then again, courtship. And then we have mating. Of course, after that, you know, the male likes to play around and the female walks around the fjord. Other animals that I saw there when I was visiting the polar bears, 
was this guy. Can you know? Do you know what that is? That's right. That's an Arctic fox. So the Arctic fox tracks the polar bears. And whenever a polar bear catches something, the Arctic fox come in and takes some of the leftovers. So every Arctic fox adopts a polar bear, <laughs> and they just follow them around. In the summertime, I can't go with the snowmobile because everything is melting. So I go on a boat, and you see my boat, the boat that I charter behind the polar bear, and I get close to the polar bears, photographing them during the summertime. And this photo, I called it Dreaming of Sea Ice. Dreaming of Sea Ice. Because uh, polar bears really rely on sea ice to survive. Without sea ice, polar bears will go extinct. Without sea ice, they cannot hunt. And that's why they trust and love their sea ice so much. And you can see this polar bear has two bodyguards, one airborne, one grounded. And this is a polar bear cub, and that's his mother. And they are on the last piece of ice in the fjord. And the ice is melting fast. The next photo I'm going to show you is one of my favorite ones, the Arctic family. So again, you can see the polar bear cub looking through its mother's feet. And again, this is a symbol of the end of the ice. A polar bear male eating a walrus in the water enjoying his snack. But sometimes in summer, they can't hunt. Okay, so sometimes they just eat whatever they can. And it can be a walrus, like you can see here, or it can be a gosling. You can see the polar bear has a gosling in his mouth, a little chick, barnacle goose. The next photo, I called it Arctic Angel. That's an ivory gull. And the ivory gulls follow polar bears around. So when I'm looking for polar bears, many times you'll see me looking at the sky. Not looking for polar bears in the sky, but I'm looking for these guys, for the ivory gull. Can you know, do you know what this is? A walrus, that's right. So I love walruses. They are really interesting creatures. And, and polar bears are the world's largest land predator. The males reach 1,500 ca uh, 1500 pounds. The females can reach 800 pounds. So they're pretty big. But walruses are even bigger. Walruses can reach 1.5 tons. So that's 3,000 pounds around. So I photographed this guy from far away. And he's big and heavy and has like extra skin. <laughs> but I like getting closer. Because when you get close, you can really see their strength. You can see their surrounding as well. So I got even closer. And then you can see really the, the environment that they live in. This is the king of the beach. And then I got even closer. So that's a walrus underwater, really close up. And I also got some images with the drone. So the funny thing about walruses and drones they're really curious. So they just when I fly the drone, the walruses immediately start swimming towards the drone because they want to see what that is. That's an Arctic fox pup, a baby Arctic fox. And they're also really cute. And they love playing catch. And fighting. But then they hug. So the Arctic is changing really fast. The polar bears are endangered, and polar bears rely on sea ice to survive. Their entire surrounding relies on sea ice to survive. Sea ice is like the forest floor in the Arctic regions. And without it, nobody, no animal can survive. That's one of the reasons why I'm doing the Greenpeace campaigns to save the Arctic. And when I'm there, one of the things that I love to do is take a swim. So, yeah, it's cold. <laughs> You're right. It's pretty cold. The, the water is freezing temperature, so you have chunks of ice around. Uh, but it, if you're tired, it really wakes you up. 
Okay, so just take a swim. And all of these footage from 2015, the one I saw with the polar bear uh, uh, mother, has got into a BBC film called Snow Bears. So I'm uh, one of four cinematographers who worked on that film, um, which was really cool. Um, so polar bears are curious. And one of the funniest stories that ever happened to me when I was there was when this big male polar bear was walking around the fjord and suddenly he turned around, looked at me and started walking directly towards me. What do I do? Run. No, you don't run. Because <laughs> polar bears can run faster than anyone. Okay? So what we did is we quickly dropped in our snowmobile and drove away. Because snow snowmobiles are faster than polar bears. But we didn't have time. We can turn on the lights. You turn off the lights. Leave the lights as they were. It was great. Yeah. So polar bears are really curious. So we didn't have time to, leave the, to take the gear with us, so we had to leave the gear behind. So the polar bear came closer, looked at my cameras, and started being a photographer. So he was looking at a seal that was over there. <laughs> So polar bears are smart, they are curious, they have different characters, different personalities, and they are brilliant. I'll take you to another place, another place that I really love, and that's the southern part of the world, the seventh continent, and I'm talking about Antarctica and South Georgia Islands. This is a penguin colony, and that's a king penguin colony in South Georgia. And what do you see on the mountain above the colony? A glacier. And that glacier used to reach all the way to the ocean. And within the last 50, 60 years, it had receded so much that an entire plain was uh, uncovered beneath the glacier. And that's where the penguins now live. And this was all covered with ice. So king penguins live in huge colonies like this and this one. And they are really interesting birds. This is an adolescent. You can see it's a teenager. So he's just losing his younger plumage. And that's penguins making penguins. And, of course, the colonies. They live in a paradise of their own. But this paradise is also being threatened by uh, climate change. So that's one of the reasons why I love going there and photograph. Here you can see the males, and they hold the eggs on their feet and under a pouch in their belly. And here you can see the male is calling the female, and they all have distinct singing. So this is band practice, <laughs> choir. And other animals that are there are the fur seals, which are adorable. I really love photographing the pups, fur seal pups. Again, they like fighting like all kids do. And then I met this young blonde fur seal pup. And she's the greatest model. She's posing singing. We even did an anti-racism commercial. This is for tolerance. One of the funniest animals I've ever seen in the world is the elephant seal. So elephant seals are hilarious. They look human. They have like this human face but they are making the funniest faces around. The next photo I'm going to show you, I called it the three tenors. <laughs> so they're singing opera. Okay, they're really nice. They should be in Lincoln Center. This is an Adelie penguin. And the Adelie penguins are one of the toughest ones around. They, they 
and the emperors are the only ones who can winter in Antarctica. And they are so tough that mother penguin has two eggs and two chicks come out. And then mother penguin, the Adeli, starts running away from them. And they follow her. And only the one that catches up gets food, and the other don't. And that's how she can assure that only the strongest one will survive. When they reach the ocean and they want to jump in the ocean from the glacier, they look over the edge and they try to find if there is any orca, like killer whale, or leopard seal, because they eat penguins. And they look over the edge, and if they can't see anything below, what they do is they simply push one of them in the water, and then they look if there is blood. If there is no blood, everybody jumps. If there is, they all stay on the glacier. But when you live in Antarctica, when you live in Antarctica, you can't be spoiled. You have to be tough. You have to be resilient. You have to survive. Because this is Antarctic summer. This is the peak of summer in Antarctica. And here you can see the Adeli penguin mother cleaning her cheek off ice. And she just stands on him so, she, so he doesn't move. And then when she's done, she gets off and he's like, what just happened here? <laughs> okay, this is a Jintu penguin. And again, you can see mother penguin feeding her chick. Again, this is the peak of summer in Antarctica. And that's what it looks like. A deli penguin jumping between one piece of ice and another. Gentle penguin, mother feeding her chick in a blizzard like you've seen before. These are chinstrap penguins with the landscape of Antarctica. And the beach over there doesn't look so nice if you're a human, but it looks great if you're a penguin. That's a leopard seal. That's the horror of every penguin. But he is, and they are, they are really extraordinary animals, really well adapted. And that's humpback whales in Antarctica. And they feed on the shrimp, on the krill, sorry. A krill is a small shrimp-like creature which is basically the base of the entire Antarctic ecosystem, the fuel that powers it. Every year, masses of krill were sucked up by industrial fishing vessels to be used as food, mostly in China. And this harvesting of krill really disrupted the balance of the ecosystem. So Greenpeace has launched a global campaign to create the Antarctic Ocean Sanctuary. This campaign didn't get to create the Antarctic Ocean Sanctuary, but it did make, create enough pressure on the, seal, on the krill harvesting companies to stop operating in the Antarctic water. So there are things that are being done. There are wins that are being made. There are accomplishments that we are doing to preserve the animals. And the next photo I'm going to show you from Antarctica is one of my favorite ones. It was the beautiful sunset. The time was 11.30 p.m. and the sun was just reaching the horizon. A cloud casted a shadow over this huge glacier. So I quickly ran, grabbed my camera, and this is what I got. I call this photo the sunset of Antarctica because huge glaciers like that are becoming more and more fre frequent because the ice is melting so fast. And just so you grasp the size of this glacier, if you look over here, you see these spots, these pixels here and here? These are Adelie penguins. And they are so small because this glacier is so big this iceberg, sorry, this iceberg is so big, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, because most of it is underwater, as you know. And of course, I was also challenged, and a friend of mine told me that if I swim 
in the same year in the North Pole and the South Pole, that shows that I'm bipolar. So I did it. So I'm officially bipolar personality. <laughs> uh, and again, the order is also called there. Okay, so let's get out of Antarctica and I'll take you to another one of my favorite places, Kamchatka. Kamchatka is in the Russian Far East, just the other side of Alaska. And over there, I went with a helicopter, an old Russian Mi-8 helicopter. We flew through valleys and mountains to reach the southern tip of Kamchatka to a UNESCO, a United Nations, uh, world site, heritage site, called Lake Kuril. So this is the helicopter from within. This is the air conditioning, you just open the window. And we landed safely. And that's what I found there. So there you can see me, surrounded by bears. Hundreds of bears. And the reason why they come to this place is that. Do you know what that is? Salmon. So that's salmon. Uh, I took this photo with a drone. And there are masses of salmon which is coming to spawn, to lay the next generation. And they come to their spawning site. So they grow up, they go to the ocean, they come back to the same spot where they hatched from the eggs. And then I thought to myself, it would be so cool if with all that salmon, I had a bear right about here. So I did. And for some reason, the salmons are keeping their distance from the bear. And the bears love to hunt salmon. And this photo was on the cover of a magazine, but it also it looks like he's a human, like, like it's a person with a big, broad shoulders. And they catch salmon. They love their sushi. So bears love to play fight. And sometimes they even real fight. And mother bear, brown bear as well, they take care of their cubs, making sure they're safe. And they love their mother. And there are family disputes like here with the two families fighting over a salmon. And then a male, a big male, came to the coast, the beach. So Mother Bear had to evacuate, take her young cubs, and get away as fast as she can because the male could harm her cubs. And the cubs are adorable. So they like playing. That's their playground. They don't have ice. They have tree logs. And they love to play with fish. So he's, like, he's playing to be or not to be, you know, Shakespeare. And there are romantic moments. And I like to photograph them hunting. I even photographed one of the younger males uh, peeing. <laughs> I'm kidding, he's not peeing, he's just standing. <laughs> and then... I told my local bear specialist, he's Russian, his name is Sergei. I told him, Sergei, I want to get closer. So we got close, as close as we could to the, polar, to the brown bear mother and cub, and I got the photo I wanted, which is showing all of Kamchatka. So you see a volcano in the background, you see the lake, you see mother bear and her cub, and you see a salmon jumping out of the water just to participate. And then I told Sergei, I want to get even closer. So Sergei said, well, you can do that, but it will be an image of a lifetime, the last one. So I got my camera with a remote trigger. So I had the remote here, and when a bear approached the camera, all I had to do is click and click and click. And that's how I'm getting really close-up images of bears. But it's not all good with the bears. Because of overfishing, 
of salmon in the Ochotsk Sea, which is the sea in the West Pacific, uh, overfishing that is done by the countries who reside there, like Japan, Korea, China, and so on, there are years where there is not enough salmon. And then we have bear starvation. So this is 2018, which was a really bad year for bears. And many of the young bears starved and didn't survive. And the mothers usually survive and the cubs don't. Because the mothers can bring more cubs next year, but if the cubs survive without their mother, they don't have a chance. Now I'm going to show you a video, a short video, that I took in Kamchatka. Some of it with a drone, some of it with a camera. Let's watch. Thank you. Now I'm going to take you to another part of the world, to an animal that I assume none of you have heard of. And that animal is the saiga. Who has heard of the saiga? No one. So the saiga is a kind of antelope. And I photographed that on the border between Russia and Kazakhstan. And this antelope within the last 30 years, went from least concerned in the IUCN, in the list for the endangered species, from least concerned to critically endangered, and we believe that they might go extinct within the next 10 years. And this is what it looks like. So this is an albino young saiga. And the reason why the saigas are going extinct is two reasons mainly. One, is industrialized hunting. So people are hunting them commercially for their meat, but mostly for the saiga horns, which are used in the tra Chinese, Chinese traditional medicine uh, as a substitute for rhino horns. So that's one reason for hunting. And you see how the males are fighting. And you see the big noses. Looks like Alf. The older people know Alf. The younger ones don't, but yeah. <laughs> So, the, well, that's one reason. The second reason why they're going extinct is climate change. In that region, there is increasing uh, heat waves, the periods of, long, of very high temperatures. And in their noses, they have a bacteria, like we all do. But because their noses are so big and adapted for the cold, in warm temperatures, the bacteria multiplies without control, without the immune system's ability to control it. And then the bacteria enters the bloodstream of the saiga, causing sepsis. So 100% mortality in the herds all over the heat wave uh, region. 100% mortality. So the next time we'll have a heat wave like that, we might lose all of them. So I went on a project with the University of Moscow to photograph the endangered saiga in one of the last refugee, refuge areas that they have. This is a, a reserve called Stepnoi Zakaznik, 
You see the male on the right, the female on the left, and the calf in the middle. Uh, that's the albino one. And these are males and fighting, and that's what they look like. So this is one of the projects that I'm trying to raise awareness to an animal that almost nobody has heard about, but they went from millions of individuals, 5 million individuals, to less than 200,000 within 30 years. So it is a very sad story. I'm going to take you now to Africa. Africa is where most of the nature happens. And that's where the most amazing things happen. Uh, so Africa, you all know, you've seen, I guess, you've seen Lion King, so you know Africa. <laughs> so now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the lions. So today, there are around 20,000 lions only. Just a century ago, there were over 200,000. So they're 90% gone. They are considered vulnerable in the IUCN, in the endangered list species. So although they look like the king of the jungle, they are extremely vulnerable and they are losing habitat. Uh, so I'm photographing them every year in the savanna. Uh, these are, this is mating. After the mating, the female always hits the male. After mating, they have cubs. And mother, the mothers, the lionesses, uh, form a coalition, a pride, and they take, off the cub, take care of the cubs together. This is bath time. I also met a vegetarian lion cub. He didn't last very long as a vegetarian, so he just went to play with his food. So he likes to play with his food. I photographed his father. And if you ever saw a rainbow and you wondered what's at the edge of the rainbow, I have an answer for you. It's a lion. Thank you. <laughs> in 2019, on March 2019, I went to Tanzania again. It was my 12th time or whatever. And I was in Tarangiri National Park. And I've seen a lot of things happening in Tanzania. But what I saw that morning was a complete surprise to me. We drove in the morning and we saw a pride of lions laying flat on the ground with their bellies really full. What does that mean? Yeah. They just had a big meal. Let's say it. Let's leave it with that. So they were really full. They had a big meal. They couldn't breathe. They were so full. Okay, reminds me of myself after pizza. So I didn't see what they were eating. I was looking around and I couldn't see what did they eat. I'm standing there like for five minutes, starting, trying to understand. Then suddenly, one of the younger lions gets up, takes five steps, turns around, looks at me and does like, I want to show you something, and goes into the bush. We drive around with the land cruiser, and what I saw there was a complete shock. This is what I saw. I saw this baby lion with an elephant. So this elephant is already gone. It died of natural causes. I asked the rangers if they know of that, but yeah, they know. And it was just sick. Animals are sick sometimes. So I saw this action happening. Do you know what kind of cat this is? It's a caracal. I don't know what you said, but it's a caracal, which is an amazing, beautiful cat. Do you know what cat this is? It's a serval cat. So there are a lot of different cats in Africa, and they are all suffering changes. These are uh, hi uh, jackals playing around. That's an agama lizard. That's a lizard. So the male shows the female a lizard, and that's how she likes him. So men, instead of bringing your wife flowers, bring her a lizard. It works better. You can ask Mr. Jackal. What's that? 
An elephant. Yeah, an African elephant. And the African elephants are the largest mammals, the largest animals walking on the earth today. Okay, a century ago, there were around 10 million elephants in the world. Today, there are less than 400,000. They are being hunted for their ivory. They are be being hunted for their ivory. And, uh, and of course, there are countries which still allow ivory trade. Hong Kong just recently renewed its ivory trade. And, of course, we are making huge efforts to preserve the African elephants, which are amazing. Another amazing animal which is also in uh, critically endangered is this one. That's a black rhino. So a black rhino, just a century ago, there were around 500,000 black rhinos. Today, there are around 5,500 left in the world. 5,500 black rhinos. Okay, so they are also in critically endangered. And this one is, has been photographed in an Ngorongoro crater in Tanzania. And each rhino has a personal bodyguard to keep it safe from poachers. These are the giraffes. And giraffes are also un really relatively unknown that they are vulnerable, but they are also. Today there are 35,000 giraffes in the world and they were, the, the numbers declined by 50% in the last three decades. There is also trying to, we're also trying to create a ban on all giraffe parts in com, uh, commerce. So they are beautiful, the tallest animal living today, 6.6 .6 meters, which is around 20 feet high. Uh, their biology is fascinating. And I won't go, we don't have the time, so I won't go through the biology. Um, what's that? A leopard. That's a leopard. Okay? So leopards are also listed as vulnerables. They are, you can see a leopard here. That's a leopard female on a tree. And that's another female enjoying her young wildebeest on a tree. And here's a leopard with a baby leopard. And this baby leopard is so adorable. Actually, it was so cute. It uh, climbed a tree and was stuck there. You can see him over here. So he's stuck on the tree and he's starting to call its mother, like that, calling its mother. So mother leopard comes up, climbs the tree, and helps the leopard baby go down. She just pushes him over the edge. I can see somebody sympathizes with the baby leopard. Okay. One other amazing bird that I saw there is this guy. That's a vulture, yeah. So the vultures are eating the scavengers. So whenever an animal kills something, when animals die in the savanna, the vultures come and gather around from all the area to feast on what's left. And now I'm going to take you to one of my favorite animals. Ah, sorry, before that, I'm going to show you. This is the hippo. Okay, hippopotamus. Uh, there are 125,000 left in the world, and actually this is the most lethal uh, mammal to humans in Africa. After humans, of course. This is the most lethal animal in Africa, and they kill hundreds of people a year by just crushing them. <laughs> okay, this is animal. That's in hyena. So hyena has very bad reputation because of the lion, lion king. But they are very bright animals. And they are true survivors. And they also, uh, they want to survive. Their, f their uh, family structure is matriarch. So the females are in charge. The females are the big bosses in, of the herd. So the lowest ranking female is still above the highest ranking male. Okay, and, and the males, no, they, they don't mess around with the females because the females will kill them. Okay, so now I'm going to take you to the story that I wanted to tell you. This is the plains of Ndutu in the southern Serengeti. And this is what a buffet looks like to this animal. 
That's the cheetah. So cheetah is one of the most special animals which I want to talk to you about today. Cheetahs, just a century ago, there were 140,000 cheetahs in the world. Today, there are less than 7,000. There were 140,000, now there are less than 7,000. And they are also uh, decreasing in numbers really rapidly. And it's the fastest land mammal on Earth, reaching speeds exceeding of 60 miles an hour. Uh, here you can see a baby cheetah kissing its mother on the forehead. And cheetah cubs playing around. Mother cheetah has to hunt. And always, in, uh, most of the time, let's say not always, but most of the times in the animal kingdom, the females are the most successful ones. Females are way more successful than males. Because males always have to take care of themselves. Females also have to take care of their cubs, not just themselves. So female cheetahs hunt almost every day when they have cubs. And this mother didn't eat for two days. So she's really hungry. And her cubs are really hungry as well. So I had to wait patiently, and I wanted to photograph this mother hunting. So she was hiding behind a bush. I got with my Land Cruiser, go, drove around, and we saw a herd of gazelles. So we placed the gazelles between the cheetahs and ourselves. And now we have to wait. Now that's the waiting game. We got to wait for the cheetah to start chasing the gazelles. So we're waiting for three hours, and nothing is happening. So, you know, you sit around, you wait, you relax, because you don't know when it's going to happen. And then suddenly, the cheetah gets up, starts approaching really slowly, and then she goes a little bit closer. And when the gazelles spot her, what do they do? They run. And then the cheetah runs as fast as she can. So the cheetah is running 60 miles an hour, and the gazelle is running around 50 miles an hour, 45 miles an hour, and the cheetah has to get as close as she can. Because the cheetah can only sustain that speed for 10 to 15 seconds. If she runs any more than that, she's in, in danger of a heat stroke. That's why when she starts running, the clock is ticking. 10, 9, 8. And if she doesn't reach it in time, she will stop. Otherwise, she will die of an, a heat stroke. And that's the game of life in the savanna. What do you think have happened here? What's the result? Who won? Who's che Team Cheetah? Who's Team Cheetah? Who's Team Gazelle? Okay, that's interesting. We have 50-50. Okay. So look at the, the, the gazelle's frightened face. Look at the cheetah's focused face. Look at four legs of the gazelle in the air, four legs of the cheetah in the air. And look at one more thing. The gazelle has kicked a rock, which almost hit the cheetah in the face, missed it by inches. And while it was in the air, the cheetah just ran underneath the rock. The cheetah got closer to the gazelle and caught it. So Team Cheetah won, and the cubs survived another day. Another family of cheetah, which I photographed, were eating a young gnu that the mother, a young wildebeest that the mother has hunted, and out of nowhere came a hyena. The hyena tried to steal the food from the mother, so she tried to attack the hyena. She managed to chase away for just 10 seconds, until the hyena remembered it's stronger than the cheetah, turned around and attacked the cheetah. She and her cubs ran away and watched from a distance as the hyena ate their food. The sad statistic is that 95.2% of cheetah cubs won't make it to the age of two-year-old. 95.2%. And the reason is mostly by, because of predation by other predators or starvation. Or sometimes the mother just loses her cubs, which also happens sometimes. The, the cubs just wander off while she's asleep. 
So it's very rare for a cub to reach adulthood. And when I was in 2017, I saw this. So this is a super mom. And she has four cubs that reached adulthood. That means she's a very, very successful mother. Another endangered animal that I photographed in Africa was in Uganda. And that's this one. What is it? It's a mountain gorilla. So the mountain gorillas were also extremely hunted. They were hunted mostly by the British in the 19th century. They wanted their paws and feet to be used as ashtrays. So the thing that we are doing that sustainable tourism is doing in many places in the world, but Africa including, is trying to raise the value of living animals to be greater than that of dead animals. So we're trying to get a rhino, a live rhino, to be worth more than a dead rhino. And that's how people would like to, to take care of them, to protect them. And when a, a live rhino is worth sixty, eighty thousand dollars because of tourism, and dead fifty thousand dollars because of the horn, so it's better for them to keep the rhino alive. The same with the mountain gorillas. So whoever goes to watch mountain gorillas pays a permit of six to seven hundred and fifty, six hundred to seven hundred and fifty thousand uh, hundred dollars. Okay, seven hundred and fifty. Uh, uh, dollars and that money is being used to recover the mountain gorilla population and when you hire somebody as a porter or a guide it has to be someone from the local community so the lo local community depends on the mountain gorillas to survive to make a living the same thing goes with the uh, in Tortuguero in Costa Rica where there is uh, they, they would hunt the turtles the sea turtles to make soup but now, because of tourism, a lot of tourists come to watch the sea turtles, and now they are worth more alive than dead. So the entire hunting industry had stopped and switched into tourism. So that's what tourism can do to help raise awareness and protect wild animals all over the world. And that's a baby gorilla. Now I'm gonna show you a short video from Tanzania. And then we have another animal I want to show you. Thank you. One last region where I, want, where I want to take you to today is Pantanal. Pantanal in Brazil. So this animal, do you know what this is? It's a jaguar. That's right. 
This is a jaguar, and they are also in danger. Today there are 15,000 jaguars left in the world. So that's one of the reasons why I went to the Pantanal region. But when I was photographing the jaguars and really impressed by them, I also met another creature, which I didn't even know was critically endangered. And that animal is this one. Do you know what that is? It's a giant river otter. It's a different species. It's a giant river otter. There are less than 5,000 of them left in the world. And they've mostly gone extinct because of hunting for their fur and because of loss of habitat. So this is a giant river otter eating a catfish. If you wondered what that is. Um, and that's a family of a mother and her two uh, babies. And you can see they're pretty, pretty large. So before we finish and we have some time for Q&A, I wanted to talk to you about the most important question of all. And that question I was asked a few years ago. And when I was asked this question, I was shocked. I was shocked. I thought it's a really stupid question, but apparently it's a really smart question. That way I think there's no such thing as a stupid question. Every question is important. And the, per the, the person asking me the question was, he said, well, I love polar bears. Yeah, they're sweet and cuddly, but why should I care if they go extinct? He said, why should I care if polar bears go extinct? And when he asked me this question, I was like, seriously? And, and then I understood that it's such a good question that I decided to do a TED talk about it. So I did. I did three, yeah, but yeah. But it's really, it really is an important question because if people don't understand why should we care, then we won't care. And this is why it's such an important question. So why should we care if polar bears go extinct or any other species for that matter? But I decided to take that question on polar bears because that's my passion. And there are three reasons, three reasons, there are way more, but three main reasons why we should care. The first reason is personal. The, the personal, I, I love them. You love them. They're cute. They're cuddly. They're adorable. Oh my God, just look at them. That's the first, but that's very subjective. So let's put that aside. The second reason why should we care is because polar bears are the apex predator in their surrounding. If you remove the apex predator, like, like it has happened in many different ecosystems, if you remove the apex predator, the entire ecosystem can collapse. So let's say with polar bears, no polar bears, more seals, more seals, less fish. Seal population crashes. Uh, communities who depend on fishing collapse. There is, uh, the, the, the fungi that the fish eat will flourish, and then they will collapse. So everything will go out of balance. So polar bears keep that balance uh, in a good way. So the apex predators are really important in their surrounding. But that's even, okay, so that's the Arctic. Okay, so, so why should I care about the Arctic? Let's go bigger. Let's go more uh, in a greater scale. And that's the global scale. Here you can see a polar bear on the mud. Polar bears are not supposed to be on mud. Polar bears are supposed to be on ice, on snow, not on mud. Okay? So the global scale is the most crucial one. Because polar bears, the main reason why polar bears go extinct is because of sea ice. Sea ice is melting sooner and sooner every year, and it's being formed later and later every year because of rising sea temperatures. And the Arctic region, region is heating up twice as fast as the rest of the world because instead of white reflective surfaces, now you have dark absorbing surfaces which increase the heat even further. So no polar bears means actually there is no sea ice. 
And polar bears are like the canary in the coal mine. And I'll explain to you if you don't know what that means. Uh, in, in the old days, coal miners used to take a canary, a bird that sings all, all the time. So they took them, the birds with them to the mine. And if there was a gas leak, the bird would be silent. And then the miners would know to evacuate the mine before they would suffocate or the mine would collapse. So the canary was their alarm system. So the polar bears are like the canary in the coal mine for our global climate. So if polar bears go extinct, no sea ice, no sea ice, land ice is melting, land ice is melting, sea level rise, sea level rise, that affects hundreds of millions of people who live in coastal regions all over the world. And that, in turn, will create uh, forced relocation, climate refugees, denied access to food, pandemics, epidemics, and no one's going to go down drowning. And if India closes the border from Bangladesh, and we already see that happening, uh, uh, there will be a war, and that's going to be even worse. So the point is, and we also, by the way, we also what happened in Venice just a few months ago, as entire Venice was flooded. Or even Norfolk, Virginia, we don't have to go that far. Norfolk, Virginia. Okay, and not to mention Katrina or, or the other hurricanes that are happening in increasing the Hurricane Dorian. So it's all connected. And the point is, protecting polar bears means protecting ourselves. And we see the younger generation. We see the younger generation taking responsibility. We're seeing the younger generation taking actions. Because the younger generation, you are the ones who will live on this planet well beyond any of the other leaders of the world. And you will be here to take care of it. And we will do our best to help you. And we will do our best to preserve and protect our planet for not only the animals, but everyone. So protecting polar bears means protecting ourselves because the world is changing. Thank you. Do we have some time for questions? Okay, so we have some time for questions. Do you have any questions? Yes, cat ears. Yeah. Push the button so you can speak and we can hear you. And they don't think the bigger scale. And that's why he asked, why should we care? Because he's like, well, the mammoth went extinct, and that didn't affect me, so why should I care about that? So we want to get people engaged and, and concerned about our planet's future. Yeah. Yeah. Why do... What is the most endangered animal that is not been, being cared for? Because earlier in your presentation, you talked about how a lot of animals have been used, like the ivory. So what is the most endangered animal that we need to care for more? Thank you. There, there are many endangered animals. There are animals that we don't even know about, like different snails and slugs and shellfish that are being extinct every year. There are dozens of species going extinct every year. But I think one of the saddest and most truthful stories that we heard is about Sudan. Sudan, uh, the last northern white rhino that died in 2018. And that's one of the saddest stories around. That's a species, a big species, not a small one, going extinct in front of our very eyes. And now scientists are trying to make efforts to fertilize uh, with surrogates uh, some of his DNA and still bring back that species from the brink of extinction. Yeah. What can we do in New York to help this cause? So there is a lot we can do. There is things we can do in the personal level, Recycle 
and even more, even better than recycle, reuse. Because reusing is a lot better than recycling. That's why we don't use plastic straws. We use reusable straws if you use straws. Or don't use straws at all. Don't use single-use plastic. Okay? So that's personal. Community level, create a garden. Do compost. Do whatever you can in your own surrounding. Talk to others and engage in explanation in school and teach others. And on the global and the national scale is create laws. And if you have influence in, in, in decision, with decision makers, try to make laws, municipality laws and state laws and federal laws or UN laws that will encourage uh, uh, people to preserve the planet with regulation, with subsidies, with incentives, uh, to try to create something that's even bigger than any one of us can, can achieve. And this is, ladies and gentlemen, this is the place where it's happening. This is the United Nations. This is where things change. This is where things happen. And this is one of the reasons why it's so exciting for you and me to be here today on World Wildlife Day. Yes. Uh, if I try to get me be more colder than, than it is now. What's the question? Sorry. Well, it's asking if the Antarctica will be colder than today. So the climate is changing. We have, as climate changes, as global warming happens, we have more of the extremes. So we could have snowstorms in the middle of the summer, and we can have heat waves in the middle of the winter, and we can have everything coming together. So everything is changing and fluctuating. But we are doing a global experiment in a global scale, and we don't know what's the outcome. This could cause, some scientists say that this could cause an increasing... Uh, self loop feedback loop climate change uh, climate warming and some say that it could lead to a new ice age because of the gulf stream slowing down because of diluted water coming from greenland so we don't know what's going to happen that's the that's the truth question nobody knows what's going to happen we have a lot of predictions uh but we don't want to change because <laughs> we like the way things are now yeah That's a brilliant question. Thank you. I, um, I didn't. <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't aware. Because when I, I, I'm, I'm not that old. I, I was born in the 80s. Okay? But when I was younger, this was not a thing. People would look at environmentalists as tree huggers and, and condemn them from society. And now, this is the mainstream, and which we, we, we should be really proud of. So uh, when I grew up, I didn't think of the environment much. I thought global warming was just two words you read about in the news. But when I started going out there and started seeing from my own eyes the changes that are happening so fast, that's when I became an environmentalist. That's when I joined Greenpeace. That's when I started to, to do public speaking and uh, uh, do commentating on TV news and, and writing ag magazine articles and so on. That's when I truly became passionate about it. And that's what I'm trying to do, to pass this passion for these kids, because they are our future. Yes, thank you. Well, the most, the, the, she's asking what's the common factor between all the animals going extinct, and that is us. <laughs> That's the common problem, us. Because we are creating uh, uh, greenhouse gases which change the global temperatures. We are hunting without regulation or even with regulation. Did you know that there are 700 polar bears being hunted uh, uh, every year with permits, legal, legally? It's crazy. They're going extinct and we are hunting them. So... Um, we are losing, we, there is a lot of loss of habitat, especially in Africa, where uh, animals cannot migrate as they used to. They're closing down corridors of migration. So, yeah, we are. And that's why we need the decision makers to take responsibility and help around. Let's do two last questions. Yeah, you in the back? 
what inspired me to photograph this, uh, these animals? Well, I loved photography because before I was a wildlife photographer, but when I went to Tanzania for the first time in 2006, that's when I, 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 my, my mind was blown by the intensity of the wildlife. And that's why I, when I decided this is what I want to do with my life, because I wanted to be their voice. Because a lot of people, let's say 99.999% of people would never meet a polar bear in its natural habitat. So I have to be their voice to share their stories because they can't talk, but they are the ones who suffer out of our consequences the most. So yeah, last question. And if you have further questions, I'm still here, but we gotta start clearing the room. Yeah. Well, every animal who goes extinct, goes extinct for a reason. And that reason is many times bigger than just this animal going extinct. So every animal, first of all, has its own right to survive like it has for millions of years until we came along. Okay, that's first. But the, the global effect, I can't tell you that if a slug goes extinct in, in Congo, it has a global effect. It doesn't. Okay, but it's another brick in the wall. It's another alarm sign that we are ignoring uh, and we shouldn't because it, it's all connected. We live on one tiny marble floating in space and this is our only home we have. People ta start talking about terraforming Mars. It's a lot easier to keep what we have than start changing other planets. We got to keep our planet alive and flourishing and healthy for, for all of us. So on that note, again, I'm going to be here if you have further questions. On that note, where is the ambassador? Oh, there you are. I was looking for you all this time. So uh, on that note, first, I would like to, give, to say huge thanks to Ambassador Isabel Pico from the Monaco Mission. Huge thanks to the United Nations for the trusteeship council chamber that we are on. And thank you so much for coming and listening for an hour and a half without talking, which is amazing. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much. No, thank you so much, uh, Roy. You know, uh, what you don't know, but he's a wonderful dad. He has a wonderful family. And that's why we are so grateful that he did that for you today. Because uh, as I said, uh, this is the United Nations. This is what we can achieve when we work together, make a difference each of at our level, so we, I represent my government, so I, I follow the instructions, the policies, and Monaco is uh, very keen, and Prince Albert II in defending biodiversity and wildlife. But each of you, I really uh, plea with you, with your teachers, it was amazing to have you here, but it must not stop here. Uh, I don't want to become a teacher myself, but please go on the un.org, I'm sure you all have access to a computer. Uh, look at Take Action Now, Look at the SDGs and, and try to, to, to think about something that you can make your own and, and make a difference. Thank you so much. I think that was amazing. And we look forward to more photographies, to more events, uh, because this is planet Earth. This is our planet. And thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you, Roy. Thank you.